This is the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, I would like to talk about it because I'm very excited. But first, I have to tell you something. I do not like museums. <laughs> I think they are boring. The paintings have nothing to do with me. My feet hurt. <laughs> have you ever been in a museum and instead of leaving feeling inspired and excited, you leave feeling tired? Get me out of here. That's how I felt until I had an amazing experience three years ago. A woman brought me to the Metropolitan Museum of Art on a romantic date. It was our third date, and I have to admit, I had been to the Met before. This is the Met. It's the most popular museum in New York City. It's the second most popular museum in the entire world. But to me and my friends, this is a tourist destination. This is some place you go when your parents are in town. <laughs> but it was her idea. She said, let's go to the Met. And we did. We went on a Saturday night in the middle of December. It was snowy outside that night. The Mets opened late on Friday and Saturday nights. It's incredible. It looked something like this. The museum, to me, she started to give me a private tour, walking around, showing me these objects that she liked. I saw paintings. I saw sculpture, Egyptian artifacts. And I don't know if it was the light that night and the space, or the weather, or maybe just having a very attractive woman talk to me. <laughs> but that night, I fell in love with the museum. <laughs> I fell in love with the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and I started going there every single weekend. During the week, I was an electronics salesman. I sold flat screen monitors for military planes. But on the weekend, every Friday and Saturday and Sunday, I was at the Met. It unlocked within me a sense of curiosity that I never knew that I had about history. So I took their audio tours. I went on guided tours. I love this museum so much that I started to give free tours for my friends. These are some photos of me doing my free tours. Now, remember, I'm a business major. I'm a business guy through and through. These are not very high-level art tours. <laughs> Usually, the tour was about 10 cool things I found and three things I want to steal. <laughs> I would take my friends to objects like this. This is a late 17th century Goa stone case built on the west coast of India by Jesuit priests to hold these bezoars, these black balls that they believed had magic, mystical properties. They thought that they could shave off a piece of this into a cup of tea, it would cure any poison. This thing held this ball that they thought you could drop it into a well, and it would cure the plague for 100 miles around. On my tour, we would walk up to the case like little kids, we would press our face to the glass, look at the craftsmanship, and talk about the things that we would put inside of it if it was at home. The answer, by the way, was usually chocolate or drugs. <laughs> my tours got to be very popular amongst this millennial group. It was just for my friends. My friends told their friends. Their friends told their friends. I got to be interested in this new audience. Museum tours for people who don't like museums. I think that's a bigger audience than the base. And I hope by the end of the tour, my friends come out do like in the museum. This became a very full-time hobby for me. A blog wrote about this. And one weekend, 1,000 people sent me emails wanting to join the tours. I'm happy to say that a year and a half ago, I quit my job. And I've spent that time building a business called Museum Hack. 
Today, we have 10 tour guides. We do 10 to 20 tours every week. We're at three major museums in New York, and museums all around the world now hire us to talk about museums and how to engage a new type of audience. People pay for our tours, right? We're an outside tour vendor. And I want to tell you today what I think we do that's special to engage a whole new group of museum patrons. And then I want to wrap it up by saying why I think this matters. It starts with our tour guides. <laughs> our tour guides are the heart and soul of our business. They are the reason that our customers love us. We hire people from all walks of life. We think you can be a renegade museum educator, you can be a science teacher, a storyteller, a musician, or an actor. But we think that storytelling comes first, and so we hire to that. I'm going to tell you about these four things, guides, games, gossip, and marketing. But our guides is why people love us, and it's why this company is going to be able to grow. It's one thing for me to do tours, but it's another thing to create this army of museum fanatics. We hire people like this guy. His name is Miles. He is a Broadway actor, and he also loves late 17th century American art. There's an amazing interpretation of Washington crossing the Delaware that people love. <laughs> Our tour guides do one thing that's pretty special. They go very fast paced on the tours. On a museum hack tour, you see two to three times as many objects as you do on a regular museum tour. Most museum tours, you see five to six pieces an hour. We see 10 to 15. These are tours meant for an ADD generation. These are people that are checking their phones, probably like you and me, every two to three minutes. So we keep it fast paced. We keep it so fast paced, the tours start at the beginning with a cheer. They meet everybody and they say, look, put your hands in the middle. We got to be a team. We got to go to the museum. We're going to say, museum. <laughs> I'm not joking. This is how every tour starts. And so that's what they do. Everybody throws their hands up and then they enter the museum. Because we're creating experiences, we're not creating tours. I want you to be inspired at the museum. Gallery fatigue is what we fight against. Looking at so many works of art and battling this decision fatigue, and so we're not afraid to play some games in the space. We're not afraid to do yoga in the contemporary galleries. <laughs> We're not afraid to do squats in the stairwells, espresso shots, pound glasses of wine on our nighttime tours. We like to keep it fast, so we do these things every 30 minutes or so. Beyond the games, though, it's the content of the tours. How do we tell those stories to people to get them engaged? We'll show them the highlights at the museum. I'll take you to the Temple of Dendur, built in the year 15 BC to the Egyptian god Isis on the banks of the Nile River, one of the most amazing physical spaces at the Met. Then when I guide my tours, I stop and I say, hey, I'm your tour guide today. Do you guys want to hear facts or gossip? <laughs> and more often than not, they say gossip, or sometimes they say facts, or some people go factual gossip. <laughs> And so we tell them the story about how the Egyptian people were in love with Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, and they wanted to give this temple directly to her. <laughs> how did the Met end up with this temple? Why didn't the Smithsonian get it in DC or other cities like Memphis and Nashville that have quasi-Egyptian names? The end of this story, by the way, when you join a tour, has an amazing reveal that everybody claps and they, and they laugh about. But one of my favorite demographics of people who join our renegade museum tours are people who we lovingly call finance bros. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, museums are fucking awesome. This is our tagline. <laughs> We're not above cheap marketing tricks. <laughs> Freud talked about using swear words to get people to snap out of areas in their head that they have. When we associate museums are fucking awesome with museums, it makes people think totally new. 
I'm going after an audience who never would go to a museum on a Friday or Saturday, right? These are people that can play Netflix. They have a, a variety of entertainment options, but I think museums are important. Uh, one of our most popular things that went viral on the internet was this photo shoot called the Top 10 Places to Make Out at the Cloisters. <laughs> Let's make the museum feel like a hot date spot, right? We love doing things like this. And when our tours go well enough, people ask, hey, can I do a private tour and propose to my girlfriend? This is a real photo from a proposal that happened about a year ago. We've done seven of these so far. And proposal guys have the craziest requests. A guy called me up two months ago, and he says, I want to hire you for a private tour. I want to propose to my girlfriend. I said, OK, great. He said, I want to go through visible storage. I said, OK, great. He said, I want there to be pictures of me and my girlfriend up in the museum like an exhibit. I said, OK, I don't think you know how a museum works. <laughs> he said, I'll pay you this much money. We found a way. <laughs> Photos are so important on our tours. We love taking pictures of people in the museum, having fun, encouraging people to take selfies. Because let's be honest, people, you look awesome in a museum. <laughs> Think about it. You're looking there with the sculptures and the art, and you're so sophisticated. People love sharing these photos. We have zero marketing budget. It's all through word of mouth. People come on our tours, they take photos, and they share those pictures to their friends. Pictures are so important to us that we actually give photos away to everybody. Fuji has this business that makes these like Polaroid cameras. We spend thousands of dollars to give each of our guides an instant camera so that people can take home a physical artifact, a memory of them having fun in the museum. Because that's our job, is for you to come and have fun once and then you'll be willing to come back again in the future, and the museum has amazing offerings for you. But these photos are very important to us, and everybody gets one. Um, a quick little bit about our business. We have 10 tour guides. We have a couple full-time staff. We're at three major museums here in New York City. Uh, the Met Natural History Museum, and we've been invited to go to the Brooklyn Museum. We're a private business. We have no official affiliation with the museum. We act as a third-party tour guide service that comes in, brings our own guides. All of our customers buy their tickets online, and we meet them at the museum. A significant portion of our revenue now comes from businesses like Google and PayPal and Adobe who send their employees to us for team building at the museum. We do fun museum tours. And Skift came, which was awesome. And we do museum consulting to engage millennials. How do we get these people? So that's all sort of interesting. I think I've spent the last year and a half building up a business that's sustainable now that can further this vision that I have. And it comes down to why. Why do I do this? Because I am crazy about museums now. To tell you why I do this, I have to start with my favorite piece in the entire Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is an Egyptian work of art. And while it may look modern or contemporary to you, this is actually over 3,000 years old. It's called Fragment of a Queen's Face. And it was broken on purpose. The pharaoh that this was made under, his name was Akhenaten. He tried to unify all of Egypt under monotheism, under the sun god. I want to point out a couple things about this. One, do you notice the amazing color? It's made from a material called yellow jasper. It's a semi-precious stone. There's two things to take away. One, at the time this piece was made, yellow jasper was so rare that the next largest piece of yellow jasper in the whole museum is no bigger than your thumbnail. So this whole face would have been a big deal. But number two, yellow jasper is incredibly hard to work with. On the hardness scale, where diamond is a strong seven and marble is a three, yellow jasper is a solid five. It makes marble look like a stick of butter. The line on the lower lip is immaculate. And I was talking to a curator about this piece, and he said, 
What's amazing is that we have no idea how this was made, right? There's a lot of mystery about it. Could be one of four people, maybe Nefertiti, maybe a woman named Queen T. But we have no clue how this piece was made. And furthermore, we have, there's no surviving examples of tools that could have been used to make that detail. And this woman was listening to us, and she stuck her head in, and she goes, I bet it was the aliens. <laughs> She did not work at the Met, by the way. <laughs> I love looking at this, and I like seeing that the Met didn't try to recreate the rest of the face. It leaves it up to your imagination. She would have been presented to the pharaoh wearing a Nubian wig, uh, maybe a dress made entirely out of feathers. Her hands and feet would have been made out of yellow jasper. It would have been a sight to behold. I look at this piece, and I get butterflies. I look at those lips and I see something and I feel something and I think that that's what a great piece of art is. I think that a great piece of art can communicate through time. 3,000 years ago, I couldn't talk to an Egyptian or read the language, but today I can look at this and I can feel something. The Metropolitan Museum of Art is an encyclopedic museum with over 5,000 years of human history. The greatest compliment that I've ever gotten from someone who came on our tours, it's kind of a famous guy who does music videos, and he said, I never would have come to this museum on a Friday night. He said, I've been on this tour now for two and a half hours. He said, I've seen things that are 100 that are 500, that are 2,000 years old. He said, I've seen things that are 100, that are 500, that are 2,000 years old, that have withstood the test of time, and I look at my own work, and I wonder if that will stand the test of time. He said, being at this museum makes me want to be a better creator. My name is Nick Gray. The name of my company is Museum Hack. We firmly believe that museums are fucking awesome. <laughs>